but you can watch the board and sing just as well. And I will say, like uh, old brother Joe Pruitt used to tell you, uh, if you're looking at the hymnals, it starts half a page down. <laughs> Let us sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay, or do I need this? Anybody need this? I'm pretty loud. <laughs> okay, good deal. Good deal. Such a joy to be with you. We enjoyed the drive up here. Uh, we have our two grandsons with us, Sam and Luke, and we're excited they're with us, and we're glad to be with you too. It's a joy to see you. It's a sweet church. We love you, and uh, we enjoyed the beautiful trip up here, and Enjoyed it with our grandsons. Of course, the only caveat I'd say today is, Granddaddy, how many more miles? Granddaddy, how many more miles? Granddaddy, how many more miles? But we're here. We're glad to be here. It's good to see each and every one of you. Kind of reminds me of, on this Mother's Day, a story Jerry Clower told of a couple having a fight in the community where he lived. And they, it was known he had a happy marriage, and so this young couple came in for advice. And he could tell they just had a big fight, a big ruckus, he said. He said, well, not, maybe it'll help me counseling y'all if you tell me what you've been fighting about the last few minutes. And the, the young woman said, he says, I can't bake bread like her mother. He said, that's right. She can't bake bread like my mother. And the young woman put her hands to her hips and looked at him and said, well, I could if you made dough like my daddy. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Would you be turning your Bibles to the 22nd Psalm? The 22nd Psalm. We commonly call this the Psalm of the Cross. It's a Psalm of David, written about a thousand years before Christ. And as we work our way through this magnificent psalm, let me share with you some information about differentiating between a true prophecy and a false prophecy. This is given to us by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. He's describing a prophet that would rise up like him to lead people out of sin. Of course, that would be Jesus. And Moses said he'll be like me to a great degree. And then he says, you can tell a true prophet from a false prophet this way. If a man speaks to you in the name of the Lord, and the thing does not come true or come about, it is the thing the Lord has not spoken, you shall not be afraid of him. In cornbread English, he's not a true prophet. If he gets up and says all these grandiose great things, and they do not come true, you know that man is a false prophet. And the coming of Jesus would be in the midst of the true prophet of God. Jesus was prophet, priest, and king. How do you tell a true prophecy from a false prophecy? Here are some good rules. Number one, the prophecy must be so remote in time that the writer of it or the speaker of it could not artificially fulfill it. I'm going to hit the lectern. That's not a predicted prophecy. It must be so far removed from the one who gave it that he could not have possibly artificially fulfilled it. Number two, it cannot be by human calculation. You cannot be able by calculus or by astronomy. Well, I'll tell you the orbit of Mars 10 years from now. If you can do it by human calculation, that is not a predicted prophecy. Number three, a predicted prophecy is not just vague generalization. There'll be an earthquake in California this year. Well, I think that'll probably go through. Anybody can make a prophecy like that. They've got to be unique, remote enough in time, and with specific details that the only possible explanation is it came from God. The Bible says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for proof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. The word inspiration there is from a word which literally means God breathed. God breathed into the writers his word. They took his word as he breathed it into them and wrote it down. Holy men of God spake as they were being moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. 
The word moved in 2 Peter 1 21 is the same word in Acts 27 17 when it says Paul's ship was driven by the wind. He could not control the ship. It was driven by the huge northeaster or Europe below that hit that ship. And it was, the Bible says, it, the ship was driven by the wind. They did not control the ship. The wind drove the ship. Those writers did not control what they wrote. The Holy Spirit controlled what they wrote. That's what that means. So now, we're in the 22nd Psalm. In this Psalm, there are some, there's information that is startling. It is mind-boggling. And uh, I had some slides prepared that didn't work. But uh, in those slides, we kind of differentiate everything. But we'll just read through it, work through it. And I think it's a magnificent study. We'll never finish in the time allotted. But I hope you, you're so hungry for what this tells you, that this is the genuine, real, dynamic Word of God. It'll get you excited, excited about Jesus, excited that He is real, His work is real, and His redemption is powerful. We're in the 22nd Psalm. Let's just read that together. It'll just take maybe about two minutes. Here we go. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the night season, and I am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of man, and spies of people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let Him rescue Him. Let Him deliver Him since He delights in Him. But you are He who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is here for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of nation have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I have poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is better within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them and my clothing to cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. Oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I'll declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify Him. And fear Him, all you offspring of Israel. For He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has He hidden His face from Him. But when He cried to Him, He heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I'll pay my vows before those who fear Him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and He rules over nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before Him. Even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve Him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare His righteousness to people who will be born that He has done this. If you look and you chronicle all this, you would do these connections. Psalms 22, 1, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did Jesus cry on the cross about? My God, my God. How did David know that? Psalms 22, 6, where it says, I am a worm and no man, the reproach of men. How did they treat Jesus on the cross? You and I would not put a dog to death but they put Jesus to death, would we? We would be arrested immediately by the ASPCA and all government agencies for cruelty to animals, wouldn't we? He said to them, I am as a worm. Then in 22.8, they trusted the Lord, let him rescue them. When they ridiculed him from the foot of the cross, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now. Let's wait and see if Elijah comes. Then 22.16, which is connected to John 19.37. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I ask you, how can that be made? When they crucified Jesus, what did they do? They drove spikes into his hands and into his feet. How did David know that? How did David prophesy? Then in 22.17, I can count all my bones. The Bible says, not a bone of him shall be broken, because he'd be like the Passover lamb in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. Then it says in verse 18, But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then in verse 22, he says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you at the resurrection. He worships with us. And as he worships with us, he declares his name to the generation, to the heavenly host. And finally, they will come to declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, for he has done this. When Jesus died, one of the last words, it is finished. He has done this. He has completed the plan of redemption. That's just a quick overview. Now let's go back and try to unpack all this. It's, it's marvelous. It's wonderful. And start asking yourself as we start working through the text these questions. David was a thousand years removed from the time of Jesus. And critics for years took a passage like this. Well, you see, it's a, it's a post-historic writing. Scribes that took some of this stuff and they wrote it down and just kind of artificially fulfilled it in Jesus. That doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't that work anymore? Because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls date as far as 200 years before Jesus. <coughs> so even the copy of the autograph predates the time of Christ. Therefore, what is said was not historic, but prophetic. So that's her, that changes everything. That's her shadow. There was a writer in the 18th century, his name was Julius Bell Allison. And when I was in graduate school, we had to study his theories. And Bell Allison said, who was very popular in the 19th century, he said, well, we know the book of Isaiah had to be written by three, six, or as many as nine different writers. And that was largely accepted in the, in the liberal theological world that this was new and it was exciting and, and therefore people didn't really have to pay attention to the Word of God until 1947 when among the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what they found? The great Isaiah scroll containing all 66 chapters of Isaiah. No one has postulated that since that I know of. <laughs> I like what Jim McWiggins said. Jim McWiggins said, every time a critic opens his mouth, there's some archaeologist in Israel sticking a shovel in it. <laughs> that's about right. That's about right. Let me stop here. I'll, I'll give you a lot of information. Anything you want to talk about before we start unpacking? 
And if I may have left, let's unpack all we can. The first one, obviously verse 1, where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from heaven me? And from the words of my brother. <coughs> this astonishing prophecy, written more than a thousand years, verified the Dead Sea Scrolls, is just too precise. It could be beyond guesswork. It's beyond a human calculation. He could not in any way have artificially fulfilled it. The Bible says, in, in Hebrews 13, 5, for example, God will not abandon us in our lives. Why? Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 10 to 12, because he wants to save us. But why did he do this to Jesus? Why did he, in a sense, forsake Jesus? Because Jesus died to save us. He was the perfect sin offering. He paid the entire debt. What is the national debt now? It's $28 trillion, something like that. My little brain, what's $28 trillion? My little brain, what's a million? $28 trillion. It would take hundreds of thousands of bank trucks to transport at a hundred dollar bill a time, one trillion dollars. Twenty trillion? Wouldn't it be wonderful if someone came up and said, tell you what, America, I'm gonna pay off the debt. Just boom, it's paid off. You never have to pay the interest on the debt again, you're free. What is it? I think something like 85,000 per citizen in debt. This is my mind. We had a greater debt of sin, folks. And God gave his son for our sin. Why? Because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, it's understandable as we read the gospel accounts what happened with Judas and Peter. Judas sinned in that he betrayed the Lord. And Peter denied the Lord three times. I don't read anywhere in my Bible what Judas did was worse than Peter, what Peter did was worse than Judas. But the difference between the two men was this. Judas gave up and Peter did. And the Lord, John 21, completely restored Peter into his service. <coughs> he finally said to him, okay, Peter, come follow me. It's all right. You're forgiven. Come follow me. Unbelievable love. He gave him, literally, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. How are you made the righteousness of God? You're made the righteousness of God in Him. I cannot be righteous enough to save myself. You cannot be righteous enough to save yourself. You cannot live better than perfect and therefore living better than perfect pay for the sins you've committed. It's all the way you pay for. God said, I'm going to give my own son I got two little boys with me today, ages eight and five. I love you, but you know I couldn't watch either of them die for you. I'm just being honest with you. But God loves you like that. <clears throat> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? We just don't stand back and wonder at that. But I think we should. I mean, how could I do that? I, I, can't, I can't even fathom it. But God did. He left him on the cross to die for us. Isaiah says, forsaken, yet to save us. The word groanings he mentions here. Uh, his, his, his words for groaning is a powerful word in the original language. It means 
groaning out so much, he becomes hoarse. <clears throat> he's, he's, on the, he's groaning on the cross. Can you imagine? Six awful hours, his groanings are so prolific, he says, my, my voice has grown hoarse for my groanings. <clears throat> we step back from this for just a moment. We see all the exactness. We see the precision. How this happened by accident. How the prophet wrote this. He wrote it because God told him the Bible was the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the entire world needs Him to be saved. Let's get down to verse 6. Verse 6 says. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man, and despised by the people. Hmm. In the book of John, if you read the Gospel of John, there are eight I am statements in the Gospel of John. <coughs> For example, John 8, 58, they said, how can you say you've known Abraham? You're not yet 50 years old. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. The great I am of Exodus is Jesus Christ, pre incarnate It was the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses from the bush, you remember? In Exodus chapter 3. What shall we call him? What is your name? And he said, I am that I am. Tell him that I am has sent you. Here is the great I am that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Here's the great I am, chronicled at least eight times in the Gospel of John. Here's the great I am before Abraham was, I am. But for you and for me, the great I am became as a worm. I am a worm and no man or approach of men despised by the people. They took Jesus of course, we know that they crucified him. They treated him like a worm. How they treated him like a worm? First of all, his trials were all illegal. Did you know that? Broke every vestige of Hebrew jurisprudence. Because when you put someone on trial, you had to go to the Hall of Hewn Stones, a Jewish law. And when you tried a person, you had to go to the um, Hall of Hewn Stones in daylight, so there'd be no conspiracy. When did they drag Jesus? It was at night. That's illegal. And then when they brought him before the great Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin was designed to act like defense attorneys. They bring in the accused, they say, here's his crimes, here's what he's done, and the job of the judges of the great Sanhedrin in this great Jewish court were to take apart the accusations. That was their job, to act like Perry Masons, to act like defense attorneys. It was illegal for the high priest to tell me what you have done. That's not his job. His job is to attack the prosecution of that person. His whole trial was illegal. Whole thing. A sham of justice. Broke every vestige that could go on and on of Hebrew jurisprudence. Why? Because they're going to treat him not like a man, but like a worm. Like a thing you put under your shoe and you crush it. Like a thing you pluck out of dirt and you put on the end of a hook and you throw it fish. Why? That was God's plan to save us. This is how they persecuted Jews viewed him. Isaiah says he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. They walked by wagging their heads. You remember it? Listen to this. He saved others. Himself he got say, stop this a minute. Do you hear what they just did to themselves? He saved others. He just admitted who he was. You catch that? He saved others. Himself and God said, what did you just say? You just said he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He caused the blind to see. He caused the living. He just confessed who he was. Come down off that cross you Christ will believe you. They wouldn't believe him no matter what. 
He suffered on that cross. Why? Why did he become a worm? I love what Paul says. Have this mind in you, which is also Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not count the equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself to death, yes, even the death of the cross. For for God has highly exalted him and given the names above every name, the name of Jesus, every day should bow. But things of heaven, things of earth, things under the earth, that every tongue of this Jesus is Lord, the glory of God the Father. He was despised, he was afflicted, he came <laughs> like a worm. Because he loves you that much. Can you imagine the most powerful being? You know how powerful Jesus was? Go to John chapter 1. Look at the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Listen carefully. All things created by Him. Without Him was not anything made that has been made. Who is that? Who's the Word? Go to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and blood among us. That's Jesus. <clears throat> the powerful hands that created the world were nailed to a cross to save you and me. And he hung there for six awful hours. They would take a victim, they would drive a spike, probably in the main bone just below the hand, or here, or sometimes they would tie them. Then they drove one spike through both feet, and they would take the victim and they would lean him slightly forward. That way the weight is up against the lungs. You could, you could inhale, but you couldn't exhale. So to exhale, you had to expand those lungs and you had to oh, lift up on those nails. And back down. And back down. For six hours. Lord, why would you do that? Lord, why would you go through all that? Lord, those hands made Mount Everest. Lord, those hands made the Pacific Ocean. Lord, those hands made the stars and the sun and the moon. Those hands were nailed to a cross to save you because He loves you. Look at verse 8. But He trusted in the Lord let him rescue him, since he delights in him. This is seen in the Synoptic Gospels. It's found in Matthew 27, 39 and 43, Mark 15, 29 and 30, and Luke 23, 35. These passages quote this psalm as they ridicule Jesus, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him, and let him deliver, since he delights in him. Remember the statement that Jesus made when he is tempted in the wilderness. He said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What does he mean by that? You're not going to turn God into a magic show. I don't have to have God do anything for me because Jesus said that God has proved himself over and over and over again. He is nothing to prove. That's why he's done to death. And I'm not going to turn him into a cheap magician just for your jobs. I'm not going to degrade my God like that. Because he's proven it over and over again with all these prophecies, with all these healings, with all the evidence of Scripture. He's proven it over and over again with his um, historic fulfillment, scientific foreknowledge of the Bible. On and on and on and on and on we can go. But they said, if he'll come and just pull you off that cross down, we'll believe you. These words were used viciously by his enemies. They ridiculed on him. He doesn't really love you, do you? You're Jesus for a minute. You're hanging on that cross. You've been there six hours. In the agony I described, I haven't even talked about the scourging and the spitting and the slapping and the stripping and the illegal trials. I haven't even talked about that. Now you're hanging on the cross and they, they say, well, all right. We'll let God deliver you right now. We'll believe. I don't think these 
these rascals would ever believe. Because the evidence was overwhelming. The evidence was overwhelming. In stark contrast, God delighted in his son. When John baptized him, behold, the Spirit of the Lord is sent upon him in the form of dove and abode upon him. We knew him not. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build one tabernacle for you, one to Moses, and one to Elijah. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye. Him. Not Moses, not Elijah. Hear ye him. God delighted in his son. And Peter says, I was there and I saw it. I saw this glory of the Lord. We'll wrap them around. Go down to verse 15, please. I'll never finish all this. That's all right. Here the Bible says, My strength. Is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death. What is a potsherd? What's he talking about? I'm sorry? Broken pottery. Broken pottery. That's right, Joe. You take pottery, not only it's made out of clay, and make sure water dries, you bake it, and you form a jar or jug or something else. And a potsherd was common, just a broken piece of pottery. Can you imagine something baked, kind of baked earth? It'd be pretty fragile, couldn't it? And talk about baking, it means you take all the moisture out of it. Just as dry as we lay down south as cotton. He says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. Just like there's no moisture left in this baked element, this baked pottery, that's broken off. It's, I'm so dry, it says my tongue clings to my jaws. He brought me to the dust of death. So fragile was his strength, it would crumble easily, just like a broken bit of baked pottery. Now the crucifixion victim commonly suffered from extreme thirst, as was the case with Jesus. Remember, he refused to take the reed that they did to give him to drink. He's going to have that full suffering. The Bible says the precision of the prophecy is just amazing. He would drink it. Then he said, it is finished. Father, no, into my hands, into thy hands, I come in my spirit. Just an amazing thing to think about that. Uh, why me? You made oceans. You made rivers. You made the Mississippi River. You made the Dale Hollow Lake. You made Center Hill Lake. You made entire lakes. Fountains of fresh water is everywhere. And now, here you are suffering from being so dry. You're just like a piece of broken pottery. So dry. Have you ever been so dry that your tongue sticks to your mouth? And that's thirsty. When your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth, you have no moisture at all. <clears throat> Verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands. Pierced is from a Hebrew word meaning they dug or bore through, they pierced. We all know what happened when Jesus was crucified. When Matthew 27, 35, the Bible says they crucified him. What did they do? We know what they did. They drove spikes through his hands and through his feet. Now I just simply ask you, how could David have known that? How could David have prophesied? How could David have had any clue of that a thousand years before it happened? Because David had help. He had the help of Almighty God when he wrote these words. Furthermore, the Bible says this. 
Dogs have surrounded me. What does it mean dogs have surrounded me? Here's a metaphor. It's just like you're out on a hunt. And you use the dogs for the hunt. The dogs smell and sense they're closing in on their prey. And they're about to go in for the kill. But instead of a panting deer, a doe, or any other animal, the sinless Son of God was handed over with no pity. No pity. How could you claim to be a religious leader, a priest, a Levite, some official, or high priest? How could you walk by and watch a man die like that and have no mercy? Have any of you ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? You remember how graphic it was? I don't think they even caught it. I think it was worse than that. At the end of that movie, I could not get up. I just looked at the same woman with a couple of friends at church, and I said, I can't get up. People wept openly in the movie theater. One man who saw that, saw the dynamic nature of that, when he, he saw what Jesus had gone through, he was a thief, he turned himself in and brought the money he'd stolen back to the authorities. He said, if my Lord did that for me, I could do this for him. This is the nature of what the psalmist is saying. They're just like a bunch of dogs that smell blood. And they've surrounded me. They're, they're not really human in the sense that they have any compassion, any feeling. They just want to protect their power. And yet, it's just unmistakable. We're out of time. Let me hit verse 17 and I'll quit. Verse 17. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. I wish we had time for the divine the garments because it's so precise. Garments is plural. Clothing is singular. Of course, that's a single row. But we'll quit verse 17. He says, I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. The enemies of Jesus look and stare at him. I count all my bones. What's he saying? Not a bone of him shall be broken. This is fulfilling Psalms 34, also Exodus 12, 46, that Jesus, in the horrific death he died, how the Romans commonly finish off the crucifixion? Break the legs. They broke the legs. Isn't that gruesome? We don't mean just tapping the leg either. Shattered the leg. Of course, when they shared the leg, what could they not do? They couldn't lift up anymore, could they? And so they would suffocate and die. But Jesus would not have a bone broken in the The passage of Scripture, I am completely out of time. I'm a little over time. I apologize. You know how preachers are. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a joy to be with you. Thank you for your great attention.